Hello, everyone, and welcome again to a Corey webinar. This afternoon, we're going to hear from two distinguished dance researchers in the field of performance science. And what that is going to be is a little bit of a discussion between them. And we hope that that will provoke questions. But before we begin, I would just like to take this moment to breathe a little bit and think about the fact that we are meeting today on unceded lands, the lands wherever you are of First Nations Indigenous Australians. And I'm speaking to you from Boonwurrung lands of the Eastern Kulin Nation here in what we now call Victoria. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Emma and Derek, who are going to introduce themselves, situate their own careers, and then begin a discussion. So welcome, and over to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that Derek and I are also here on the lands of the Boonwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. Um, I'm Emma Redding and I'm the director of the Victorian College of the Arts, the VCA at the University of Melbourne. And prior to that, I was um, a professor in performance science at Trinity Laban, which is a conservatoire of music and dance in London, England. And I was in charge of the dance science department, which included research, education and knowledge exchange. Yeah. And my name is Derek Brown. Uh, Oppenzeller is my full name. I am also currently at the VCA. I'm a senior lecturer here in dance. And prior to the VCA, I worked in two different places in Europe. My home that I identify most with is Holland, so the Netherlands, and Amsterdam in particular. So I worked at the University of the Arts in Amsterdam and the University of Bern in the Institute of Sports Science. Uh, in both places, looking at dance science, but also performance science as well. And then prior to that, I had a career in dance as a dancer. So I think that's enough for now. Yeah. And Derek and I know, know each other quite well. We do. So we thought it'd be quite nice just to have a conversation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And of course, you've been here a few months. I've been here almost two years now. <laughs> um, so I wonder whether actually our thoughts about dance science have changed since yeah. being here and talking about dance science and our previous work with new colleagues and scholars here mm. in Australia. I was thinking about, um, you know, the title of this um, this talk, sort of the debates, current debates in dance science. And for me, what I've found I've done in the last um, year or so is almost debate the field itself, as opposed to kind of what are the new research questions in dance science, more what is dance science? And um, and I think I've sort of shifted my view about maybe the tensions in dance science or the sort of the paradox or I was looking at thesaurus earlier, paradox meaning also absurdity mm -hmm. of dance science, because in some ways, you know, it is an oxymoron, art, science, those two words, don't go well together. And dance science, it, it is the, the kind of the coming together of two disciplines to make a new academic discipline, dance science. Dance science didn't exist not that long ago um, as an area that you could study and research at university. So it's a kind of this, this new amalgamation of, of quite disparate disciplines. But my statement for Derek to respond to is um, surely, anyone interested in dance should be interested in both the art of dance and the science of dance. Yeah. What do you think? I, 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 that's a, a lovely opener. I, I, I accept that paradoxical sort of inquiry. What, what is the absurdity, if you will, <laughs> of, of dance and science? And I would also add to that for all sciences, because music has a science, um, or performance, performance in general had these sciences. And on the on the one hand, you could say it's this sort of academic jargon that looks at STEM versus STEAM or ac academics that rest within mathematics and engineering versus those that rest with, within the humanities. You could say that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think the more interesting and integral part of it is that it is born out of this increasing knowledge in the last 30, 40 years about the performer, the true demands of the performer and what those may or may not be. 
um, depending on which area of, of dance you sit in. And I think I would agree since being here, I'm, I've only been since January, uh, since uh, July, excuse me. So also already then grappling with this idea of what do we mean by science? What do we mean by investigation? Um, and also trying to unpack that in this place situated in Australia, but in particular in Melbourne and what that might look like. Um, I don't know if that answered the mm, provocation sure. as much. Yeah, It's funny because I used to, it used to just reel off my tongue the sort of aims of dance science and now I, I kind of hesitate a bit I used to sort of say well the you know dance science the aims are to enhance dance training and optimize performance through physiology psychology biomechanics mm. um but of course the dancer isn't situated in any of that mm. that the dance training the mm. dance performance but what about the actual dancer I remember years ago um you know, in the early days, sort of 20 years ago, when um, there was also a disjunct between, uh, you know, those who were involved, the sort of the neuroscientists and the sports scientists and the dancers and the sort of trying to understand each other's worlds. Um, I, I always remember that there was a time at Sadler's Wells when a neuroscience said to, um, stood up and said, well, surely you dancers want to um, get to a point where you don't have to think anymore about what you're doing on stage. It becomes so automatic that you could almost think about what you're having for dinner tonight or, or your shopping <laughs> list. And of course, you work with sports scientists yes. a lot because you've done a lot with the Royal Ballet yeah. Company in London. Um, is there still that disconnect or do sports scientists, would you say, have they got a, more of a, you know, an empathetic? I think that, I think, yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it has moved on. So I think sports science, just like dance science, has gone through this nascent sort of movement and, it's very encouraging now to look at the sports sciences at the Royal Ballet in particular and see in the way in which they talk about dance and engage with the material of dance and dancers that they start to understand that it's not just about the quantifiability of dance, but it is about the holistic person. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard for certain types of scientists. So those who might be biomechanists, for example, are really looking at the quantifiability of what a jump looks like. And in those conversations at the, the Royal Ballet, those individuals start to engage in questions like, okay, it's a jump, but is the height determined by the ability for the physicality to just be present, or is that dancer engaged in some kind of artistic thought process and mm. or an artistic way of thinking about the jump? And those are really wonderful conversations to mm. be in. You hear someone that's not from dance gingerly asking questions about, well, maybe it was the music or maybe that dancer was really in the artistic headspace. And they feel very nervous about it. But at least in those engagements I've had, you can start to see that they feel like they might have permission to explore a world that they've never had before. Mm. And my favorite um, provocation in those meetings uh, not all of them, but many of them, my provocation would always be dancers don't need science. Science needs dancers. Just to provoke the idea of what are the skills that a dancer is bringing to the table that scientists might have never thought about. Like this idea of what are the multiple factors that go into simply jumping mm. up into the air. It's not just a physicality. So I think that's a provocation to add to music and all performing arts that we have skill sets that go way beyond the technique of an oboist or, you know, there's a collaborative element to all performing arts in, which, in general that I think many scientists, I speak now for those who deal with dancers, are starting to be aware of and I hope starting to appreciate as well. That's really yeah. nice to hear. I, I do remember sort of the view that sports scientists were here to save us, here to yeah. come in and fix us. And there is a point mm. to that. Mm. We do get injured a lot mm. and um, and we do need better treatment. Mm. You sure. know? Um, and one thing I noticed coming to Australia, of course, was the Australian Ballet had all of that amazing yeah. specialist That's healthcare right. Right. Um, as a world leading, you know, organisation that others aspire to. Yeah. Not all companies have that, but, okay. but there is there is the the support that we need mm. as as dancers. But it's interesting you talked about the jump there because yes, what what makes a good jump, and then what is a good yeah. jump? Because of course, 
The jump isn't necessarily the height of the jump, no. though height is important and it's an indication of muscular power. Mm. But I remember talking to the, those those guys where, um, you know, yeah, it was sort of, well, how do we measure the determinants of success in dance if we can't measure them quantifiably mm. through jump height or jump distance or number of turns? Mm. What? How do we measure the aesthetics and what, what are the immeasurable or how? How close can we get to measuring maybe the effectiveness then of a new intervention or a new treatment mm. if so many of the um, the determinants are subjectively scored mm. and aesthetically based? Yeah. It's funny, I, I'm, I, I like being a bit of a provocateur in, in, in life in general. And one of the things I'm often fond of saying is ballet has very specific things that it provides in terms of technique. You learn to bend your knees, you learn to stretch your knees, and if you learn to do that very well, you learn to jump in a very particular way. <laughs> but what it does also bring is all of this history that we don't talk about. We look at things like shouldering. People rarely do shouldering in mm. life, epaule malls and all of these ways of looking, but we do do that in life. You and I are in fact doing that right now. We've set up a webinar where we are shouldering each other in a very particular way. People do it all the time when they're in their car doing their makeup and they'll make. These are these are skills that seem very small, but they are they have a rich history with regard to how people interact with each other in a group. Um, and in that way, I think it's a bit, not just ballet, but all dance is a very strong candidate for observing behavior in group settings. Mm -hmm. Even a dancer who's a single, a single solo on, on stage um, is not there as just a soloist. There are so many people behind the scenes that that one dancer is supported by and that dancer garners support from, um, even if an audience just sees one soloist. So dance is this community idea, it is this engagement of many, many individuals. Mm. And, and I think... That's why I always provoke other scientists by saying, this is what you need to learn. You need to learn that the quantifiable parts can't exist separately from the qualia. It is the qualia, it's the human messiness that actually makes sports science, dance science, performance science really exciting. And just to add on to that, you make a very val valid point. What is a good jump? And the beauty of dance to the frustration of scientists is that it has to change. Within a four year PhD phase, that will change. Mm -hmm. It Indeed. depends completely on who is the director of whatever company, ad hoc, freelance, doesn't matter. That's one key element. And one key element for science as well, they are the champions of prosthetics, but those prosthetics are changing the very way in which mm -hmm. we call a body. Mm. What do we mean by a body now? Uh, a dancer's... You're taking me on to my fourth. Oh, sorry. Is that your? No, <laughs> we're only on number one. Oh, sorry. But we'll no, hold no, that. We'll, we'll hold that one. Good. We'll hold that one. Oh, I was going to say something about jumping. Now, oh, the determinants of success. Mm. Yes, they're so culturally specific and time specific. I still remember I did a study. If you remember the three-year talent de development study, yes. what is talent, yeah. and can we nurture it, train it? Is it dynamic, changeable? Or is it stable, innate yeah. and stable? And so we looked at the various characteristics of talent according to artistic directors. And I just remember um, Wayne Eagling um, said, uh, oh, well, it's all about feet. I mean, it's just feet. Feet feet matter more than anything. Yeah. And that was Wayne Eagling saying that. But um, but yeah, it changes across mm -hmm. time, doesn't it? My debate number two, oh, yes, and yes. then we'll get on to yeah, that, love that. was, um, so the other... I suppose it's, uh, yeah, the, the paradox or the contradictions. There are many contradictions in dance teaching. So we know that. And uh, But I wondered whether you wanted to yeah. talk about yeah. those. The sort of, you know, dance teaching is based on tradition and experiential yeah. knowledge. And I've, I've come to really respect experiential knowledge. I remember when I started out in dance science, it was all about graphs and data and uh, trying to... Um, you know, unpick that tradition mm. that actually there's something so valuable about experiential knowledge and tradition and what gets handed down. Yeah. Um, I'm learning that a lot here. Exactly. I, I think you're right. I mean, some of the some of the ways and means in which I am not even grappling, but learning to embrace 
what I'm learning about indigenous knowledge and ind indigeneity in general is this idea of what is passed forward, mm -hmm. um, what is yeah. shared and what is passed forward. And um, I, I can certainly say that in terms of dance education, um, what's, what's interesting about dance education is, is it has been an oral tradition. We don't see it as an oral tradition because we accept that Martha Graham has codified her technique or Merce Cunningham has codified his technique. And we have Vagonala and we have Kjekati and we have all of these codifications. But those codifications in the beginning were based on specific types of bodies doing specific types of dance at a specific time frame. What's interesting about dance education is we try as hard as we possibly can to push those through the generation. And in some ways, and sometimes we're really successful and in, some and in other ways we fall short because the syllabus becomes more important than what is actually being presented in front of you at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's not just a classical ballet. Even now in hip hop, we are starting to get, and, and street dance, we're starting to get qualifications of technique. And one of the dangers of that is when we're not dynamic, thinking about talent identification, we are not able to keep those techniques flourishing in the time we live in. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, no one was still on stage when they had a hip replacement. It wasn't even a discussion. Um, and now people come back two days after hip replacement and you know their physios have to literally hose them down and hold them mm. down not to do their first developé. It's like, no, just start with plié. So bodies are changing. And I feel our education sometimes falls short in that we are keeping a tradition without recognizing that there are small shifts. And the beauty about ballet is that we have documentation. We have wonderful videos of what first position looked like in 1910. And we have- And it's different and from it's how it different is now. Now, is different. all of these things are different in, in other techniques, even in you know some of the, you know, if you look at the Cunningham technique, it has morphed since Cunningham is no longer in corporeal form on the earth. It's a, different I mm. mean. so it's I think it's more that filtering down if you will from the companies that in our tertiary education and secondary education and even our vocational education that we find ways to help teachers recognize it's okay for a dancer not to be 180 degrees turned out it can be perfectly functional in their body to just find what their turnout is for them today and I suppose somatic practice has allowed us to embrace the body and the individual mm. and recognize that bodies are changing and we are becoming more inclusive. So yeah. bodies are becoming more diverse. Mm. And also choreographic styles are becoming more diverse as well. And, you know, dancers these days are not graduating and going into the Graham Company or the Cunningham no. Company. So why should they train in one codified technique? And so I suppose they're working in an eclectic mix of dance mm. styles and therefore need to be Pre prepared for that yeah. as well but also down on the ground in the studio the contradictions that happen yeah. constantly are quite interesting so this kind of conundrum mm -hmm. the sort of what is anatomically correct or biomechanically correct if we can say that anything yeah. is correct versus kinesthetically or aesthetically mm -hmm. right or mm -hmm. ideal or wanted yeah. um so i'm just thinking about the very obvious one in ballet when teachers still sort of say throw your leg in Grand Batman from the back. And, yeah. you know, I used to be like, that's anatomically incorrect. But actually, I understand why yeah. the image works. Yeah. And, you know, it means that the pelvis is more likely to stabilize yeah. than tuck under. Yeah. So what is kinesi kinesiologically wrong, mm -hmm. incorrect, I should say, is kinesthetically ideal, yeah. desirable, right? I think you're spot on. And I think, I think it's a great provocation because, um, the idea of if we take just lifting your leg or throwing your leg, if, if you do that in specific ways, it might be kinesthetically correct or technically correct, but it might not be artistically what is desired. And so here we come up, we butt right up against mm -hmm. what is so special about dance. It is a human body for the moment. Mm -hmm. right? We can debate whether there are other forms of dance, but it's, it is the human body who refuses 
to accept its limitations. Mm, or tries to extend them and push them and challenge them. Doesn't accept them. Mm -hmm. Because artistically, artists move are always moving via a body. They are never just resting in the body saying, this is all the body can do. Yeah. <laughs> but so come I'm just going to do, come and watch this. They're always going, ah, but I, I, I mean, we, and, you know, I, I, we use, we use ballet in this context to explain its tradition, not to accept that it is better or worse, but we have so many examples in ballet where artists have gone, what is this verticality? I don't want mm. verticality. I want everything to be off center which shifts the entire dynamic of the company the physios all you know lose gr get gray hair thinking okay now everyone's off center uh, a whole new host of injuries that they didn't have in previous seasons and that challenges the physiotherapist that challenges the teachers everyone moves forward that is the artist resting in the middle of that and i think as a as a researcher and as a scientist i'm always humbled by that because I think, oh yeah, that's the behavior part. You mm. can't, you you can't ask for perfection and think perfection is excellence. They are two different things, uh, and perfection is rather boring. And excellence opens up a whole other world of no, aesthetic. No, no, perfection is engaging. Yeah, absolutely, and perfection is boring. Yeah, yeah, true. exactly. Yeah. So I, I think, in terms of the question about education, I think. What's exciting, I'm thinking about um, Wayne McGregor, just off the top he of my head. He just came in mind. <laughs> but also, you know, there are many, William Forsyth, mm. I think there are many examples, and I'm sure there are many individuals here, even in, in, in Melbourne, Carol Brown, um, the head of dance here, who walk into the studio and bring with them the knowledge of what excellence could be rather than what perfection could be. Mm -hmm. And you brought up the idea about different bodies. I think that's what's so exciting now, um, even in, in all forms of dance um, and in hip hop, for example, it's so empowering to see, and, and street dance to see the female body and the female dancer taking charge of their own identities in those spaces and creating for themselves as opposed to sort of stereotypical, always top down, heteronormative, uh, masculine normative way of looking at dance. So it pops up everywhere now and I'm really excited. Mm. And now it's just a question of finding a way of filtering that into the studio and into the training, because it's a good word you provoke with dance training. What do we mean by yeah, training? Yeah, no, I know it's a bit contentious. Yeah. Are we animals or is no, it, you know? <laughs> That a circus. I'd like to think that we're just going to broaden out that term and still use it. Yeah, I know I people are right. so against it, and then we talk right. about dance practice or dance yeah. preparation. Oh. That's been sort of passed around. That brings me nicely onto the last one, and then maybe you've got a question for me. No, for I, I like yours. I like this. Okay, so it doesn't feel one by the no, other. It feels, no, no. it feels all over the place. So the last one, but we've been touching upon it, is about dance science in terms of its blind spots. So there are many blind spots in dance science. And I've realized that more here than ever in my last 25 years of working in dance science. Mm. And um, I'm not just talking about the sort of the lack of research in other genres, because of course that's, you know, dance science has mainly been focused in ballet, contemporary, in the Western world, um, a very Western uh, notion of what science is. Um, in the last three years, we've seen the research. If you look at the Journal of Dance Medicine and Science, Irish hip hop, classical, Indian classical dance, and, um, yeah, Chinese dance, so um, circus dance. It, it, and it's not just that in terms of the language is English, the literature is in English. So when students say there's no literature in such and such mm. subject, and we all take that as mm. the case, it's not because yeah. there might be some research published in other languages, of course. But I'm not just talking about that, I'm talking about the sort of as we touched on the sort of the what is a body what is healthy safe practice and according to who and for who and I was talking to an indigenous colleague in dance the other day who said well you know dance science talks about floors being safe if they're sprung and if they're rightly lit and air conditioned but for me my that's a colonized floor for me she, she was saying for me the floor 
that is safe for me is a circular one that's outside. Mm. So I just thought that's interesting. We go on and on about this rec these recommendations and these guidelines for safe practice. Uh, but who are they for and who were they written by? Anyway, I'm sure you've got lots to talk about. No, on this no, no. I, I, I think it's an, I think it's an excellent provocation. Um, and it's a humbling one as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a necessary one now, where we are now. Eh? Yeah. So I guess you and I, from completely different perspectives of performance science and research in general, are still sort of coalescing yeah. in the same place and asking the question, for whom? Um, and you know, as a person of color, I often am confronted with that mm -hmm. idea about a floor, a strong floor is based on a particular anatomy as well. Mm -hmm. It's based on a particular idea of what we consider, we don't use that word anymore, a plumb lined yeah. uh, body to be. What, it, what does it mean to be aligned? Um, and sprung floors have encapsulated that in their algorithms and their programmings yeah. when they start to talk about what, what are the stressors that are coming into the floor based on what the stressors are when a dancer lands or when they move across space. So even something like that as a person of color who has a very different body, who has a very different type of alignment, very different foot shape, very different knee structure, very different hip structure, the idea of what ideal is, even in something as mundane as a floor, uh, has huge ramifications if I'm coming from a non-Western perspective mm -hmm. or from a, a non-sort of traditional proscenium dance mm -hmm. perspective. That could be wildly different. I'm thinking along the lines of someone like Yvonne Rayner, uh, who was a champion of modern dance in the in you know in the in the the older days with regard to what it meant to be pedestrian versus what it meant to be a professional dancer. And there's ideas about what space looked like and how you mm. occupied that space. And many of those dancers were done in trainers mm -hmm. without a sprung floor and without, and you have beautifully now on social media, amazing ballet dancers doing the most incredible grand jetés in the middle of the in street London. in London or yeah. in, Chicago you know, and, and yeah. no one's going, oh, that floor is going to, and, and they're not doing that either. So mm -hmm. it is a, it is an interesting balance when you're talking about health and safety, because that's what we're talking about. And we're also talking about institutionalization, because when we're in institutions, we do talk about health and safety. We, we, we want to care for our individuals. And so we do create these frameworks um, so, so yeah, I think that, I think that, I think, um, learning from our indigenous colleagues, but also I was just having a wonderful conversation with a musician who is a Taiwanese and I learned that there is an entire population in Taiwan that is indigenous. That's not shocking, except I knew nothing about it. Mm. So I thought, what? So I went and looked it up and I thought, oh yeah, of course. The indigeneity is everywhere and it brings with it, keyword, different knowledge systems. And I think now where I am is, I love being a scientist. I love numbers. I am a quantifiable freak. I really, it's my thing. However, I'm learning to embrace more of these other knowledge systems, even of quantifying things, of system of systematizing things. And that leads, yes, yeah. and that leads to research methodologies yes, and absolutely. you know more participant-centered co-designs yeah. research methodologies, which mm -hmm. is much more aligned with perhaps some of the cultural practices within the yeah. indigenous colleagues that we have here and friends that we that we work with, the sort of the sense that we're not it's not about going in and observing from the outside and sort of more ethnographic. Mm -hmm. Uh, work that has been done and is done and it's about working from within yeah. and uh, designing with and not on. And that's a great point. I think still, if you ask about the sort of friction in that science, um, um, I think one of the things we can change is the buy-in. Mm. Um, I think you and I had a conversation in a completely separate uh, arena about what is happening in the autistic research at the moment. Yeah. So an autistic individual is not the patient only they are the expert in what it is that needs to be studied yeah and just that little nugget yeah. how can you include 
the expertise of the person you wish to study. That will radically change the way we you know, think about dance science or performance science. Mm, and that's happening in medicine a lot. Absolutely. And so that's a simple, that's almost a simple one that even at the student level, we engage yeah. with the student from their perspective um, and then build our research questions and our methodology from there, as opposed to uh, a sort of STEM only based yeah. top down. And so I think that I, I hope um, and our, our conversations that I'm having with you here, but also with my colleagues who are ind indigenous here as well, that those are starting to shift and turn in my own mind in terms of accepting other knowledge systems mm. and allowing them to flourish as well. I think allowing them space to be present as well.